this paper. It's called Looking for a Bold Point by Maldacena, Simons Duffin, and Jiboidov. It's actually going to be me and Rodrigo who are going to share the paper. So I'll be talking about this first section, kind of laying the grounds for what Rodrigo will say later. So th the idea will be to um, discuss an al analog of Landau singularities for correlation functions in position space. So uh, I'll start by discussing an example, which is just phi to the fourth theory and a four-point function, so massless phi to the fourth theory. So first order in perturbation theory, this four-point function is given by um, this integral here. Um, where W is the point where the interaction happens, or where the first term in the interaction Lagrangian is, or the, the, term, the interaction Lagrangian term is, and the xi are the um, positions of the operator insertions. So we want to discuss what singularities does this um, correlation function has. And the first thing we can notice is that we can have a singularity when um, for a point W, which I'll call W0, where this equation holds. So if all of the, if all of the um, insertion points are null separated from the interaction points, then we may have a singularity. However, we may be safe if we can uh, deform the integration contour of, of this position in order to avoid this WO point. And um, so we may be safe if we can find some vector V nu such that um, This holds. This expression here holds. Uh, greater than zero. So if we cannot find, th this is another necessary condition to, this cannot be true if we want to find a singularity. So the paper um, argues that using uh, uh, this mathematical result, which is called Farkas lemma, that these, this second condition here is um, equivalent to being able to find four um, numbers, not all zero, such that this equation here is true. Um, So if we can find four positive not all zero numbers such that this equation holds, and we have that this w0 is like this, satisfies this condition, then we have a singularity in this diagram, um, in this correlation function. So basically, physically, what these two equations are saying is that if we have four insertion points, and we have the interaction point in the middle, then they are all separated uh, by no lines. And we have momentum conservation at the interaction point. So this is the, an example and for a four-point function, but we can generalize this to higher orders in perturbation theory. And this is how it goes. So basically, we want to compute a correlation function like this at order k in the uh, in the 
expansion, the perturbative expansion, and it's going to be something like this. Uh, which, if we take uh, a massless theory, this is, and all of these things are local fields. And this is just a product of Green's functions or propagators, which depends on distances and which are singular when uh, the distances are zero. So the generalization of the first condition there is that these distances, some subset of the distances is zero. And the second condition, um, point two, here, just denote the point where this happens as, as this. And the second point, the deformation condition, is basically an analog of, of, of that, is finding some vectors such that this is true, um, where this thing here is just a derivative of the distances with respect to the interaction points, evaluated at the point where there should be a singularity. So again, by this Farkas lemma that I that they discussed there, you can rephrase this condition as there being another set of um, positive, not all zero points, um, numbers, alpha, aj, such that this condition here holds. So, I mean, these are just the same, basically, it is easy to see that these two equations are a generalization of the ones over there. And again, they imply physically the same picture that we have in that Landau diagram there. So this condition here uh, implies momentum uh, conservation at the interaction point. And this equation here implies um, that no separation of, of, of the insertion points and of the uh, interaction point. So these are like the analog of Landau's equations for, for um, position space correlation function. And so this is the, the, the derivation that they give for for these equations and in this picture. And Rodrigo will discuss later this setup in the context of ADS-CFT. So just before I, I finish, um, just two things. The first one is that we see that we're doing a, a theory in Lorentzian space so that there are solutions which are not to the first equation there and here, which are not the the, which are not saying that the points are at the same place. So you have no separation as opposed to just like OP singularities. And the second thing is that all that I have done is like just perturbation theory. So yeah, that's it, I think. Yeah, I'm doing massless particles only that I'm discussing here. Maybe you can repeat the question. Yeah, so the, the question is um, if I'm considering massive particles also, because in position, in momentum space, Landau singularities, 
they refer to massive particles. So, Yeah, so um, they argue that you can um, take this discussion and talk about massive theories also, but I, I have refrained from talking about this just for the sake of simplicity, because I, I can just use the fact that the propagators are like that and so on. If you have um, massive particles, the propagator is not necessarily like that. It's more complicated. But they argue that since the propagators have singularities when the distances are, are no, then you can kind of repeat this thing. And also they argue that in that case, since the distances are like no separated, you're basically talking about very high energy particles and you can kind of uh, ignore the masses. Yes, I think that that's the point. It's the, the external, you're throwing particles from the, those points and they, they collide, it's kind of internal lines. It's not inside the loops. So at least for that case. Here, of course, you can have different... Yeah, for example, you have two interaction points and they have to be null separated and so on. Uh huh. Um. You, you mean if I exchange xij for xji, then it switches sign? Yeah. So just w what are the what are the implicit conventions for what i and j run over in that linear combination? They run over the positions of, of the location points inside the, the correlation function. So there are w's and x's and, and they're the set of points where the, the distances are, are zero. So are null separated. So th this last equation involves Ws, you said, or I, I just see Xs? Yes, they may, oh yeah, it's just Ben notation. So th this, I'm sorry. So this is the definition of this X with two indices. It's not the same X as here. It's, it's this thing here. It's the dependence of the distance with respect to the direction points. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. I just took their notation. So can you s make a few comments about the connection between this and what we saw on Friday? Uh -huh. Okay. Um... So the, the f I think that one connection you can make is that the, the singularities refer to one shell particles propagating because of the first condition there. But uh, apparently they are in different regimes. Because I think that here in this context, you take things which are very high energy, as I said, and they, they are really close to each other, whereas in Landau's case, um, you don't have to take this limit for things to appear. You can consider particles with, um, with like discrete energy and, and so on. I, I mean, I, I, what I was after was just uh -huh. some trivial, more technical comment about oh. uh, 
Can you say a few words? This is a starting point. Yes. Is that equ equation like that, right? Product uh -huh. of propagators in position yes. space like that. Yes. In class, it was pr product of propagators in momentum space. Yes. Okay. But then the second step. Can yeah, the, the second step would be like doing that Feynman yeah. trick and so on. Um, actually, I, I didn't want to go into this because I think that that's what Francisco will be talking about. But as far as I understand, they use this Farkas trick just to, as a shortcut to get to these equations. In principle, you could get to these equations here or the second equations there from doing Feynman trick. And then the alphas are the Feynman parameters and, and so yes, on. Yes. But uh, they, uh, as far as I see, it's just a trick. You can get the same result by doing this analysis. What is this analysis? I think uh, you are uh, referring to a lemma that you mentioned twice, but you did not give us any idea what yes, this lemma is. Yes. So it's a lemma about the existence of solutions to linear equations. So basically, the lemma says that if you have a system of equations or, or uh, this vector here, and you want to find a solution to this equation, the lemma literally says that you can either have this condition holding or that condition holding. So, uh, I mean, as far as I understand, th that's, the, that's the point of the lemma. It's the, uh, about the existence of solutions to linear equations. Um, and those linear equations, I guess, would be like the extrema of these functions, like phi of the lecture, right? Sorry? They are the equations that come from imposing that some that we are at some extremum after doing yes, the Feynman yes, trick, yes. like in the lecture, yes. I see. So here, the, the condition is, is literally this one, and it comes from being able to deform the integral um, to avoid these points. So if you look at, the, at how the distances depend on, on a redefinition of w by, by v, then this is the condition you get for avoiding the points. And, and yeah, th then they rephrase this condition l like, mm -hmm. uh, like that thing there. But yeah, sure, e it's, see, okay. it's equivalent to doing the Feynman trick. And uh, one thing you did not mention is uh, why did you pick this paper? Why is this paper interesting? And uh, why, why do people care about this paper? Yeah, so I think maybe this will be about what Rodrigo will be talking about, but um, as far as I understand, the idea is that here I'm doing a perturbation theory on a flat space theory, and using the ADS-CFT correspondence, you can map this to some regime of a gravitational theory in the bulk, and um, the idea of the paper is showing that you have you have Landau singularities for the boundary theory or for some CFT in in the boundary on flat space, which you cannot find doing perturbation theory. So uh, I think that that's one of the the, the highlights of the paper. It's, it's as far as I see it. So, uh, Rodrigo will say this later, but he'll get Landau singularities for this theory that I'm discussing, or that theory that I'm discussing, without doing that sort of computation there. And it not in the same regime as I, as I did, so it's not for lambda very small, it's another regime. Yeah. Sounds good. And uh, sorry for mm -hmm. being late. I, I think uh, you're computing some um, ultraviolet uh, uh, poles, right? Uh, mm. Divergences, correct? Or am I wrong? Yeah, I, I, mm, not necessarily, because I mean, that's w these distances here. So these two points, they don't have to be very close to each other for us to have the singularity. That's the point of doing things in Lorentzian space. They can be separated 
not very close together, but they just have to be null separated. So I think it's, I may be wrong, but it's kind of a different interpretation. So it's not like the two points colliding or two things getting really close to each other. You can have things which are just separated by a, a light ray, uh. and, and you can have. Does, does this appear in momentum space or just in, in yeah, spatial I, I, representation? I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know how to interpret this because as Egon asked, so in momentum space you can have things with mass and you don't have to take this high energy limit to study the, the, the particles, so I, I'm not sure. Just one last question. Mm -hmm. So, which is more or less the same question mm -hmm. that uh, Rodrigo and Egan asked already. So, in position space, position and momentum space for many things, we should be able to go from one to the yes. other. So, did you see examples or did you try to work out some examples of, say, a bubble or a triangle, but computed in position space instead of momentum space? Yeah, we were discussing this earlier today. I, I, I didn't know the answer to the question, but um, so because we were kind of puzzled for if, if you take a bubble, then you would have to this this like some fire. Feynman diagram in position, in mm -hmm. momentum space. So I, I don't know if, we were discussing this earlier, I'm, I'm not sure if this diagram reduces to just this diagram here, because if you would have, for you to have two, if you would translate this to position space, then you would have to take two particles propagating to another interaction point. And, but this two, for they to appear in a Landau diagram like this, these two points here, they should, they need to be null separated also. So I think that the particles will need to take the same path or be parallel or collinear, but I, I'm not very sure about, about this. Did people revisit usual Landau diagrams but now in position space after this paper or? Um, or are these separate things? And the type of singularities that we probe in position space, these very null singularities, uh -huh. are different from the singularities we saw in momentum space. Yeah, I, I may be wrong, but I, I'd say that from this discussion about the masses and and the energy scales, that they are different phenomena. But uh, maybe wrong. Uh, okay, wait, let me just set things up. Ah, oh, I need to get the archive paper uh, number, I forgot. So there will be some non-trivial overlap between my uh, uh, presentation and Joan's. It's sort of my fault, I suppose. I, I didn't really check uh, to see if uh, 
there was uh, some overlap between his paper and mine, but but I'll try to be, the, the approaches are slightly different to, to the first part, and I'll try to be uh, quicker on the on where there's overlap. So um, the paper is mostly about uh, probing um, singularities and massless gauge theories um, in terms of coordinate space, and then trying to get some physical uh, interpretation of what's going on and using this to probe uh, the divergences that happen in uh, jets in this particular case uh, and do some power counting. So uh, why do we do um, uh, massless theories? Why do we use them instead of massive? Well, Jean gave us a, an idea, but the general idea is mostly that it's just simpler. Uh, propagators in uh, position space for massive theories are just very complicated. And in, in, uh, if you have some um, massless theory, then it's very simple and analogous to what we had before for, uh, for our propagators in momentum space, right? So, so this is for a scalar field. Uh, then whatever diagram we have will be just in general some product over the vertices. And then you integrate over the possible positions of such vertices, and you have a product over lines of some lines, some numerical factor, and then just the separations. This is just a sine, and the position squared plus i epsilon. And this depends on the type of particle, this uh, exponent. And then you can go to uh, Feynman parameterization that we're used to from Lundell's paper, in which case you have uh, instead, some alphas, which allow you to get some a common denominator, which you can then use to understand the singularities, right? Um, and then, yeah, dp. And then you have sort of this common a common denominator, and it depends on the positions as well. And f, where this is just the uh, usual alpha. And then z is the separation between two vertices plus i epsilon, right? Minus. And then, uh, well, we could use Landau's framework here already because we have basically the same thing. But instead, sort of uh, for power counting, it's useful to think of, of a more general uh, idea, which is suppose you have a function which is defined like this, right? And you integrate over omega. So if you want to, to explore singularities of this, you, you need to look at poles on this contour. But uh, generally, this is, uh, you, you can usually deform the contour and avoid them unless one of two things happens. Either you have a contour where your poles are on the boundaries, in, in which case uh, you cannot move them, or you have some other con uh, the contour and the poles pinch your contour in such a way that you cannot uh, con uh, deform away. Either way, you know, this idea generalizes very easily to mo more uh, higher dimension things. You have surfaces, singular surfaces defined by the uh, vanishing of this denominator. And if they pinch your hypercontour, then you have problems. And if it, they're on the, uh, they coincide with the boundary as well. Either way, uh, the point is, you, you, uh, the necessary condition is the vanishing of the gradient at these, at these surfaces. So, right. Uh, and this is, you can define as well uh, variables that parameterize the space out of these surfaces. I'll call them normal variables. And uh, variables that parameterize the space on these surfaces, I'll call them an intrinsic. And it's important because normal va variables vanish as you go to this singular surface, whereas the intrinsic remain finite. Um, so you apply the, 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 uh, this to, your, to our case, and you just recover immediately the Landau equations, I'll either alpha j is 0, or the analog, I suppose, or, the, and, or this is 0. And you need uh, some, this is just a sign indicating whether the line is going out or in of a given vertex, and you sum over vertices. Uh, or this, the lines coming out of vertices. And this, uh, there's a very clear physical picture here, right? You have on-shell uh, massless particles traveling on uh, light-like uh, trajectories. And you have, if you assign a momentum to this, you have momentum conservation uh, on each vertex. So how do you apply? Th uh, uh, there's also a very interesting interplay between this and uh, uh, momentum space singularity. So for example, 
if you have a diagram like this, right, uh, and then this is y, uh, x2 or y2, x2, x1, and y1, I get one solution to this, for example, is this, x1 parallel to y1 and y2 parallel to x2, in which case, what is this telling us? Well, it's basically saying that the photon doesn't change the direction of this trajectory, so this is soft, right? Uh, so, uh, well, let's then use these ideas to sort of probe the, the divergences that show up, and, well, one way of looking at it is that there are two contributing factors at singularities. There is the volume of the normal space, which vanishes because the normal coordinates vanish. And there is also this, the integrant, which depends on both normal and intrinsic variables, depending on a given solution of the Landau equations. Uh, so what, what you can do is you can factor out, uh, out of your integrand. So for example, you have some set for a given solution of uh, normal variables and some set of intrinsic variables. And you can scale out. Uh, suppose they, they scale uh, with some scale lambda as you go to the surface, so they vanish as lambda goes to zero, these, these ones. Then you can scale out this theory as something like this. And you can also factor out of your, of your integrand uh, de uh, its dependence, its leading dependence on lambda, because that's just what will contribute to the singularity. So you have something like this. You have uh, some uh, contribution here, which is some de uh, depend depending on the numerator and denominator of your integrand, and you have some new f here that depends on the uh, on the descaled variables, and one plus something here, which goes with lambda. So you're interested in here because you're trying to look at a bound for how these diverge, right? And as you approach then this sort of singular surface. What you have, uh, you can do this sort of parametrizing the the uh, the zi's on uh, on a, an n sphere, right? So w w if you take the leading behavior here, you'll have something like d lambda squared, and then you integrate over the normal variables, and you you're limiting them on a two on an n sphere, so it's something like this. And uh, then you just integrate over the remaining extra intrinsic variables, and there's a product here, and your f, right? And then once you factor this out uh, and descale these variables, you'll have something that's uh, basically an integral over d lambda, and then you have a factor of lambda gamma minus 1, right? And then whatever else is here, where gamma is n, minus the degree of homogeneity. So here you clearly see you have an influence from the vanishing normal space and from the integrand, right? And then you, you have to solve to given examples the Landau equations and try to look for, for this degree, of, for leading degree of homogeneity. And there's, as it turns out, there's a very interesting way of doing it, uh, which is basically going to light cone coordinates because there's a, a dual sense in which uh, you can Often, when uh, a plus coordinate in light cone coordinates is intrinsic, the other will be normal, and there is a there is an interesting interplay here. And if you apply this idea, then for example, for a, a jet, which is in for a one particle jet, which is basically just a dressed propagator, uh, what you find is that gamma is uh, smaller, and this is very easy to to do in, in the sense of. Uh, because you're just looking for a bound, so you can make some very uh, strong assumptions. You find basically this for uh, where this is, uh, where this is the number of uh, vertices with two fermions and a gluon, and this is the number of fermion lines. But this is just zero, right? And therefore, you find that, for example, for this type of jet, this is just uh, logarithmically divergent at most. And uh, you can apply this general idea for more complicated jets. You find interesting factorizations once you go to light cone coordinates. But uh, you have the, there, there's this classical result of soft and hard uh, factorization jets. And this shows up, which is interesting. And uh, well, that's the idea. And why this is interesting? Well, uh, it's, well, we can do this. So we should, in principle, uh, expand our toolkit. And 
there are often some situations where, where coordinate space calculations are nicer. For example, the paper cites Wilson loops. There are often situations where doing that in coordinate space is nicer. So maybe there's other examples beyond this where, where, where the coordinate space amplitude uh, approach to this is valuable. So, well, this is sort of the general idea. Yeah. While, while people wait. Uh, yeah, I, I lost in the, when you said that you can use a scale that you, mm -hmm. uh, in here, and I, yeah. I, I didn't understand this step. So well, how, how do you come? The idea is that ZIs here, they're just, they're a subset of your, uh, of the, the, YKs here, or, or, or the variables in general, alphas as well, but the, the generals are uh, uh, variables are, uh, that you're integrating. And they're particularly, they're normal space coordinates in the sense that you have the, the you have, for example, for a pinch singularity, you have the, the surfaces approaching the contour, and you can uh, parametrize the, the space that's out of this surface. No, yeah, so the point is you have, uh, maybe it's so, so I'll just, you have some integral that's something like this, right? The omega one over G. And suppose you have, uh, you're, you're trying to, to find uh, singularities where this, where you cannot uh, deform the contour away from the singularity. And this happens, a pinch singularity happens when you have a, a pole here and a pole here, and they literally pinch your contour such that you cannot move the contour away, right? Because if you do, uh, you cannot use Cauchy's theorem to, to justify the, uh, the, the deformation. But th the point is that as you have these surfaces, which in general, I, th this point becomes a surface, right, in, for, for higher coordinates, and uh, you'll have, uh, you'll have, as the space will be basically everything that's out of the surface plus everything that's in the surf on the surface, right? So you can parametrize uh, the stuff that's on the surface with the Ws and what's uh, out of the surface with the Zs. And as you get close to the surface, everything that's Z dependent has to go to zero, right? Because you're, a pro you're suppose you have a sheet of paper and then you have a Z out here, it needs to go to zero as you approach the surface, right? So what I'm saying is basically that they all uh, go to zero with some scale lambda. Suppose they don't. They can, they can go to with lambda squared, for example. If they did, this uh, basically just means that they vanish faster, which, but we're interested in giving a bound, so, so it's not really a big issue. Maybe, uh, but there, there's, an int there's a good point to be made of whether this scale is unique. And uh, for, for all variables, and the paper argues that for our case, it's, it is, uh, you can, but it doesn't have to be in general. Uh, he doesn't really give a lot. Of, he says that basically with a smart choice of, of coordinates, you can uh, unify this, this scale. What was that diagram? You uh, drew that diagram there, and it was so fast. What, uh, what was sorry, I was rushing a bit. But I was trying to illustrate sort of how the the singularities in position space uh, interface uh, or uh, correspond to momentum space ideas, right? So you have uh, I'll just redo it here so it's better to look. See, so you have this triangle diagram in position space. Uh, I'll just highlight the vertices very clearly. So you have uh, x, you have some y2, x2, x1, uh, y1. And wh what I'm saying is, and this is sort of the origin, I suppose, uh, and what I'm saying is that one of the solutions to those equations ha ha happens to, to occur at where x1 is parallel to y1 and x2 is parallel to y2. And what this is saying is that uh, the, oh, sorry, there's a photon here. The, the emission of this photon, 
or the whatever gauge boson this is doesn't affect the direction where, where it's of the propagation of the of this fermion. So you can associate some collinear or soft idea to this photon. Okay. And uh, so you emphasized a lot this notion that there are two types of coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it make contact with what we saw last time? And uh, in a standard bubble Feynman diagram, is there an analog of this separation between these two? Why are we discussing these two sets of coordinates? That's well, why we're, we're discussing them is mostly what well, we don't have to, but for the, the sake of understanding how the, the, the power counting works, it's interesting because you have very clearly one set where, where they vanish and one set that remains finite. So if we're looking for extreme um, uh, behavior, it's interesting to isolate where, which set, which set uh, has which behavior. Uh, as for um, understanding... Sorry, let me just clarify uh, to see Sorry. if I understood. Uh -huh. So you are saying that not only we want to find the singularity, but we want to understand the degree of the singularity, to understand how strong the singularity is. Yeah. And for that, we want to understand not only if, the po if there is a pole and if it's dangerous, but what's the degree of that pole. And, exactly. Uh, and that's some analysis that we did not do in class, which was further in Landau's paper. Mm -hmm. We did not reach that point. And you are saying that in position space, the analog of that analysis involves separating coordinates into, OK. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, I understand. Uh, OK, but I stopped you. You are, you are still saying something? No, uh, I mean, it's sort of the, the, the direction I was going to go. Uh, I was basically going to say that we're interested in understanding. And, and in, in Landau's case, we didn't f particularly go into this, but, but when we're we're, uh, when we're studying how the, what happens exactly with the behavior of these functions, it's very important to sort of isolate which ones behave as, how it was in, in, in each sort of way, yeah. More questions? Are there more questions? Yeah, maybe one yeah. minute or two. Okay. So, um, just uh, about what Rodrigo was asking. Mm -hmm. There, what you are, you're reparametrizing the Z's. Is that yeah? The I'm point? I'm saying that if they, if Z's, the original Z's vanish with the scale lambda. Uh -huh. I can sort of factor out this scale and descale mm -hmm. the, the, the variable such that this one has no lambda leading lambda dependence. Uh -huh. but, but the z's are always, they no. always denote their the separation? No, they generally, uh, not necessarily, they're, they're generally just the, the variables that are, that, that, that are not on the, the, the singular surface. So, so they parametrize space uh, it depends on a given solution of the Landau mm -hmm. diagram it's in, it's it's it, of the of the diagram you're you're analyzing right given a, a, a given a, a set of equations that you are generated mm -hmm. from the diagram you have different solutions uh, associated to different singularities or singular surfaces and then the uh, a subset of of these will be uh, a subset of the the parameters that solve your equation will be outside of the sur the surface, and a subset will be on. Okay. And this is the what each one of those is. Mm -hmm. Thank. What's the paper? It's uh, massless. Uh, it's uh, the archive number is there, but it's massless uh, coordinate space singularities in massless gauge theories. I see. Who are the authors? It's one person. It's. Uh, yeah, uh, it's Ordogan, uh, Ordo something like that. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, it's. Well, do you have it? Uh, I don't remember the name. Okay, that's okay. Well, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. I think we should uh, we should move on given time. Okay. So who is next? Let's thank. Uh, <laughs>
OK. Uh, so let me just uh, put my time here. OK. Uh, start. So I'll be presenting a paper by Correa uh, server in Zibodov. Um It's called Probing Multiparticle Unitarity uh, with Landau Equations. This is the archive. OK. So um, the idea is to extend the analysis we've seen uh, previously, uh, last uh, class, uh, to diagrams of the type of the, of the box type, let's say, like this. Not necessarily this uh, diagram, because they don't consider vertices like this. This is an odd uh, theory, uh, odd symmetry theory. But I find it very instructive to uh, look at this uh, diagram as a warm-up. But as I said in the beginning, the title is uh, something has something to do with the multiparticle, and you can see if you plot the real s and t variables here, s being the Mandelstam uh, variable and t here, the s and t channels. Okay, uh, interested in the region where uh, the the physical sheet region. Um, you have uh, a region at 16m squared from, for both of them, where they call it um, the multiparticle region, given that here in this region, things like this, okay? In the middle, if you have all of these uh, uh, diagrams being on shell, you have four particles, okay? So this is this region here, and it keeps going for uh, all intermediate states, okay? Then um, let's, as I said, uh, this is very instructive to do this example because I can then make all of them uh, come to this example later on. So let's say uh, I name the variables like this, the momentum variables like this. Okay, I have a loop. Let's say Q3 here. Okay, okay, I have a loop like this, and then I, then I can write down the Landau equations for this, which is something like this. Like this part is just a yada yada yada, the same thing we've seen last class, so I'll be very fast. Uh, then we find that the mu i j's here are just the cosines of the angles between the variables q, the q i variables, okay? And this must have a non trivial solution, and for that to happen, the determinant i j must be equal to zero, and then we have a, an equation for all of the mu's, okay? Now, from here, I can also write down uh, using at each vertex uh, the uh, conservation of momentum, okay? And I can find uh, P1, P2, P3, yada, yada, the same thing, okay? And then I can find mu 1, uh, 2, okay, just squaring this. Uh, let me, okay, okay. Squaring this, and I will write in this manner, just because um, I will. Uh, you see, it's it's it's. Um, you see in a moment, it's because I will generalize to uh, n number of legs later, but I can from all of these four equations, I have four consecutive mu's mu. I won, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, but I still have two to go because it's uh, I have six six mu's. So and the other two is it's simple. I just sum this equation here, and I have p1 plus p2 is equal to q3 minus q1, and then I I also have squaring that equation uh, mu13 will be equal to q1. It's a very similar equation. Okay minus s here, the s channel, okay? Okay. <laughs> and I have uh, the cross metric uh, uh, term, which it will be given uh, just swapping 1 and, and 3 for 2 and 4. Then I have all the six mu's, and then I just plug in into this, okay? Then I can do, for this example, <laughs> I did in Mathematica, uh, the, the equation I actually could I mean, I have the equation there, but I'm not, it's not worth writing down. But um, if you plug that, you find that this equation turns out to be this. Minus 4, S minus, minus 4, equal to 0 here. P squared equals Q squared equals M 
squared equals one, um, just for simplicity. And uh, since I'm in this region here, I don't care about these, okay? And this would be um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an equation, uh, uh, a curve, which would be like this. This curve is not there. Um, I can also give you another um, explanation to why this, this curve is not there. Also, I didn't mention at the beginning because they, at the beginning, they were um, um, the beginning of the paper. They were. Uh, uh, summarizing non-results, uh, these curves, these two curves here, the, these are non-results, uh, okay? Um, but we would have another curve like this if this was there, but it's not, okay? Let's just cross like this, okay? Now, let's say, what if we had uh, like this, this loop, okay? Then we would find this like this, and this like this, and let's add more legs, okay? And just to, I'm just putting some superscript here, okay? Now, now this is odd uh, 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 symmetric, and uh, if you now now you have two more Landau equations, and these Landau equations would be something like this, okay? Of zero, then bo both of them are parallel to each other, bo both of those vectors, but they are also, uh, they, they have the same size. Since this is positive, this means, this implies that Q11 is equal to minus Q12. Okay? They are opposites. So you can think now of this as an overall Q1 here. and this is the same for here. Uh, you have an overall Q3 here, okay? Then, if you write down what this overall one, Q1 will be, it will be Q1, 1 minus Q1, 2. But this is equal to this. So this is like 2 Q1 tilde, let's say. And Q3 will be 2 Q3 tilde. And now, if you uh, pay attention, uh, uh, for the, um, there will be a rule if you want to uh, uh, use the, the what I've done here. Okay, uh, in the Muse equations, you change Q1 for two times Q1 uh, tilde and Q3 by two times Q3 tilde, and you just plug in. But for the Landau equation, Landau because you have the loop and the central loop. The, you just pick one of the vectors. So you change in the Landau. Just uh, uh, Q1 you change for Q1 tilde, and Q3 you change for Q1, Q3 tilde. You just use the same uh, 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 results previously. Then you plug in inside this, and you find this equation. <sighs> S minus 16, T minus 4, minus 64 equals 0. Again, we don't care about this. And this is essentially uh, equation 3 from the paper or uh, the gray, the gray uh, curves in figure 5 that happen to be of the same color that I drew, that I, um, I drew here. Uh, of course, the, you have the crossed symmetric uh, T if you make the, the cross symmetry here. Um, then, from this, I mean, it's very tempting to generalize. <laughs> uh, if you look at graphs like this, like N1 here, N1 legs, N2 legs, N3 legs, and four legs, okay? And you just do the same analysis, but now uh, this, you would say, uh, you change an i in the mu's equations for an i uh, qi tilde, and here you change qi for just a qi tilde in the Landau equation, and you find the polynomial. You can find the polynomial 
for s and t, which must be satisfied equal to zero. Apart from, well, okay, yeah, this is a polynomial, okay? Uh, and, uh, oh, I worked out this polynomial. Uh, and if you plug in 1, 1, 1, 1 for the ends, you find this equation. If you plug uh, 2, 1, 2, 1, you find this equation. And uh, they also treat this equation here. Okay? Uh, and if you plug uh, um, 2, 1, 2, 3, you find s t minus 4, s minus 16, t minus 16, minus 192 equals 0. And this is equation B1 in the paper, or red in figure 5, which is this curve. So indeed, you can probe the multi-particle region using uh, Landau's equations, which is the title of the paper. Thank you. Questions? Oh. So, very, very basic. So, that thing there the are the pink ones? What? The, the equation upstairs, no, on the third board, on the third board. Yeah. There are the pink ones here? Yes, yes, yes. The same, the same colors. I okay. tried to match the colors. Okay. And the first one doesn't appear because you're considering, or because of the th three legs that you're saying? Yes, but also because if you work out mu i's, ij, for success, uh, let's say, okay plus one, okay? This will be given by I. Uh, I can give another reason to why this is not happening. Uh, not even in that theory. And I think this is why they don't consider these odd theories, odd, uh, the, these non-odd theories, because uh, uh, they can be tricky, because once you have a solution to the mu's, you don't actually have a solution to the alphas, for instance, because alphas must be positive. Um, but let me just uh, write down, this is Okay, for the consecutives, okay, plus one. And um, if you plug in uh, just once, you, you find this is a half, that's 60 degrees. If you find uh, all the, th three, three vec uh, the, the four vectors, they, they have 60 degrees between each other. They are like this. It, it, it's, a, it's a pyramid. And here you Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and the P's are like this, okay? But now you can see they don't sum up to uh, zero. They cannot sum up to zero. They only sum up to zero if the factor uh, alpha must be negative. So it flips one of them uh, from uh, this equation here. They cannot sum up to zero. So this is another a reason to why this is not present, and that's, I think, why we consider those kind of theories, because they're more simpler. I, maybe they always have solutions. I don't know if this is provable, but I just say, I just found this, uh, uh, well, because if you find this equation, not necessarily we have vectors that uh, uh, satisfy the, the properties they, they should. So, yeah. So would you say that a theory of massive particles, does it have or not a singularity in the locus that you crossed? If it, a theory that is, has no z to symmetry, will it have a singularity at t minus 4 times s minus 4 equals 4 or no? I cannot answer that. I don't know. Because maybe on higher diagrams, because for instance here, not based on higher diagrams, just based on this diagram. On this diagram, okay. What? I don't know, because here we've already um, done the weak rotation, and we're considering 3D uh, 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 vectors. Uh, and as this is true, that four degrees, uh, uh, um, four 
3D vectors, 3D vectors. No, oh, they're 4D. Maybe this could happen. I don't know. I don't have the, the intuition for this in, in four dimensions. But uh, in 3D, at least, I cannot embed those four. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> That's my answer. Because you, you have four vectors. Uh, and embedded in 3D, they cannot, all of them have uh, 60 degrees between all of them. But maybe in four dimensions, yes. That's my final answer. I don't know. I don't have the intuition. No, I think you said it correctly the first time, that the vectors are such that when you start drawing, you cannot add them up with positive coefficients. But do you, I don't know if you remember, in class, there was another example of a potential singularity. And then when we analyzed the alphas, we saw it's not there on the first sheet. Because one of the alphas was 0? Was yeah, or negative or something. Or negative. In the bubble, for example, we would predict some singularities. And one of them is not there in the first sheet. But if you cross, it will be there on the second sheet. I think this is the same. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think this yeah, singularity the in the yeah. second yeah. sheet, yeah. it will be there. Yeah, it's there. And this singularity is the counterpart of the singularity that um, Juan was mentioning in his first talk, that mm. uh, if you have a box in position space, mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. looks like there is a singularity. It's not there on the first sheet. Mm -hmm. And you have to continue to the second sheet, mm -hmm. to this more Lorentzian regime, to see the okay. singularity. I think it, it'll be exactly the, yeah. the same. But now, uh, I'm not sure, given it's a four-dimensional uh, vector, that we cannot uh, put them uh, 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 with 60 degrees between all of them. No, but these vectors, you can always make them three dimensions, because you can go to the center of mass. OK. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. so my argument works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, super naive question. In, in the end, you said that we can indeed probe the multi-particle region. Yes. Using so, what you mean is that, I mean, if you're, I don't know, measuring scattering amplitude, you expect to see like a singularity like that. Yeah. In this, in yeah. Just this is this is the real part of S and T, yeah. and here we are studying the discontinuities. I I, I think I should have mentioned, but I was mm -hmm. kind of nervous at the beginning. I didn't mention this. Uh, uh, we are studying the discontinuities on the real axis, and uh, in the the picture we've seen uh, last class, this is like uh, we have a a, a a a cut from here, okay, and then we have a discontinuity. From uh, in the in the S, this is S, real S. This is imaginary S. So this is the, this picture, is and it? we're probing this region, which is the multi-particle region where nasty things happen. And okay, and it's, so uh, yeah. So you can I don't know, super naive. You can see this in experience somehow, maybe, or this is completely like. I don't know, but I, I, like, um, <laughs> like I'm not used I've, to experience. But. I've calculated <laughs> some singularities. We will find these discontinuities. For instance, those curves here, they, they were known. Uh, was calculated by Mandel uh, Stam in 58. Uh, and because uh, here, oh, OK, you can see, take this curve. This, this is a nice example. Because uh, that curve comes from these. Oh, that's a very bad diagram. Uh, OK, come from this, OK? Now, uh, you can see here, this is not the multi-particle region. This is not. But this curve goes into the multi-particle region. If you cut this diagram like this, you see that only two m's are uh, uh, on shell. And then this is why we have this part over here, and this is what has been calculated by Mando uh, Stam. Uh, but and through a bunch of hard arguments that I did not understand, you can uh, extend analytically uh, this to this, uh, and also that to that. Okay, uh, and eventually we have all of them on shell, and this is the multi-particle region. Blah blah blah. Okay. So, can you remind us what the physical meaning of energy is? Okay, it's the overall energy input from, uh, uh, for, I mean, uh, we could say uh, energy of the center of mass squared. Yes, and T. Ah, uh, okay, T. 
that's interesting. I don't have uh, the same the same uh, uh, definition, but it's like it's like the same, but viewing the the graph like this. Because uh, uh, these graphs have a bunch of symmetries, and we could say, well, instead of thinking of uh, uh, the particles going this direction, we could say they're they're going that direction. Or you, <laughs> that's even complicated because we have to take this one, drag here, and that one, drag there, and that's not a that, that's not planar. I cannot draw it. <laughs> this this would be a T and S. And what's the question? Yes. Okay. Then I don't have a, a definition like I have for S. Uh, for yeah, for S I do, but uh, for T I don't know. I just don't. Know. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. It makes sense. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you go to the center of mass frame, and one is minus. Uh, you have the energy here, and then you have p, and the other is like p minus p, and then you you can uh, uh, do this, right? You can, uh, yeah, yeah. I I I believe that. I, I believe I've seen I've seen this. T over S, yeah, yeah, as I can write, T over S is equal to what? One plus cosine theta. Minus two? Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my, my question is that, I mean, if you were an experimentalist and scattering particles, you would expect to see such a discontinuity like in your experiment somehow. Oof. Um, well, well, depending on the angle. <laughs> uh, depending on the angle of your experiment. <laughs> yes, uh, then you, you see, uh, yes, of course, then uh, you, you could... Uh, 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 from just you have the input s, then you given the angle, you also have the input t, and then uh, uh, you can probe this region here and eventually see if you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here, and probe the multiparticle region. <laughs> yes. For uh, I mean, in two to two scattering, it's uh, for four m squared uh, on. Yeah, very good. Perfect. Then what about t? the same, I would say. Let me. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, okay, not. Really? Because uh, this is like 4m squared. t is equal to ta ta ta. Uh, 2m squared. I'm being very cautious, maybe too much. Uh, yeah, between. That's weird. Mm -hmm. Um, that's weird. The minus sign? Okay, but uh, well, I was not caring about the minus sign. Maybe I should. Uh, yeah, the minus sign. Then it's uh, something like this. I don't know. It's on the on the other, on their side, and maybe through analytical uh, continuation magic, I could go there. Mm. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Oh, okay, that's not the same. Okay. 
which possesses some symmetries. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. É assim? Hã? Dá, tá. So can I? Okay. So, okay. So now I'm going to continue the discussion on the paper that Joan presented in, in the start, and I'll start by saying that one instance in which studying position space correlators is very useful and very common is in CFTs. So when we think about CFT, one is naturally led to think also about ADS. So in this talk, I'll be ADS. So due to the ADS-CFT correspondence, we know that we can relate observables in the CFT to observ observables in a gravitational theory in an ADS space with d plus one dimensions. So in this talk, I'll be concerned about understanding how Landau-like singularities can arise in a curved space like ADS. I'll be, I mean, I'll only talk about ADS. So, okay. What's the point? Suppose we have a CFT living on a Lorentz cylinder. Okay, so we have time going up here. And from the ADS CFT conjecture, we know that we can compute correlators of operators in these, in, in these cylinders by considering if we, if we want to compute correlators as strong coupling due to the ADS CFT duality we can compute them as something we call a Witten diagram expansion in ADS, which is essentially a Feynman diagram expansion, but inside ADS space. So we'll be concerned with Witten diagrams. So these Witten diagrams should, should probe the strong coupling limit of the CFT, which lives in the boundary of ADS, OK? And uh, so, OK, first of all. Just a small comment about ADS space for those who are not used to it. Uh, you can describe ADS by embedding it in R2, D. And they will be the set of points such that this equation is satisfied. Go on minus 1. You can exchange the minus 1 for a R if you want to do radius R ADS, but we're not concerned with that here. And ADS has a boundary in which the CFT lives, and those points in the boundary are described by no rays in R2, D. So points such that this equation is satisfied, and uh, we say they are rays because we have the following identification. Okay. So uh, in the paper. Um, Malda Senna and collaborators were concerned with, they <coughs> studied the following theory inside of ADS, which is a lambda phi to the d plus two 
in contact interaction inside of ADS for a massless theory. Remember, we are in a d plus one dimension of the ADS. And <coughs> we, in particular, look to the following diagram. We compute a d plus two point correlator, co correlation function in the boundary CFT by considering this diagram inside of ADS. So this should compute a correlation function in the CFT at the strong coupling regime. Okay. So just where we have like these five fields coming from the boundary, which means at some point in ADS, some point Q. And we have just like the usual Feynman rules in flat space. This will be proportional to a uh, an I lambda times an integral all over ADS, ADS d plus one, dq of a product of what we call uh, a d plus two objects, which we call the bug to boundary propagators, which take into account the fact that we have fields on the boundary that meet at, meet at some point in the bulk of ADS. And we will be then concerned with, with, with uh, the following integral. OK, here XA are the points in the boundary in which our operators are localized. So that we have the following and so on until XD plus 2. OK, it turns out that if you do, I mean, these bulk to boundary propagators, you have an expression for them. You can study these integrals. And I'm not going to go through that in the talk because it would be too lengthy. But it turns out that <coughs> there's a special singularity in those kinds of objects which happen when the following equation is satisfied. Which are so when now that's why we <coughs> we are considering d plus two point functions in d plus one ADS so that here this index this is an R two comma d index so this goes from one to d plus two this also has d plus two components so that's a square matrix this means okay let's understand then the consequences of this equation which as Maldacena observed, implies in a singularity for this diagram. So the fact that the, the, the <coughs> determinant of this object here vanishes obviously implies that there are zero eigenvalues for this matrix XIA. So in particular, this implies that <coughs> there exists a, a point, a vector P, such that for our way, this is zero. So what this means? This essentially implies that there's a, there exists a point P inside of ADS. So suppose we have ADS, which is inside of this cylinder. And these diagrams here. And for instance, we have, suppose we have two dimensions so that we are computing a four point. And it can be here and x4. This equation implies, turns out to imply that there is a point P inside of ADS that is connected to these points on the boundary by no geodesics. So we already see here an analogy to what João and Francisco presented. So it seems that in curved space we can exchange these long lines by no geodesics. Moreover, this matrix can also have a, a left no vector, which implies the following equation. So there should exist a, a Ka, an object Ka, such that the following equation holds. Ka x a i equals zero for all i in that case. So okay, this already looks like some 
something like a, a, a momentum conservation, but we see now how the, this we can make this more precise. So you, you can actually always use the <coughs> the isometries of ADS to put this point in the following. Write this point P as follows, and then this would imply that X is equal to zero and where now X A is equal to zero and A, where N A represents the unitary vectors that point along the new geodesics that go to the point X A. So this for instance will be N three and four and so on, okay? So these points in A represent this vector tangent to the geodesics that go to the points in the boundary in which the operators are inserted. So, okay. So then if you pl we plug this parameterization for X in the equation above, it just implies that there's a sum over A such that our KA and a should be equal to zero. Remember, this is a unitary vector. So what the second condition implies is just that, okay, we have a point P such that it connects to the boundaries through no geodesics. And in the <coughs> locally in the vertex point P, we have momentum conservation. And it ter turns out that if we expand this integral here around the point Q, Q equals P, it implies that all Q ways are bigger than zero. If you look at this equation carefully, this should imply that not only there should be no geodesics connecting all the points, but some of the operators should be in the past and some of them should be in the future. So this is the general picture derived by by Mauda Senna. How much? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is the main point of the paper. Uh, and what they argue later, okay. This, in, oh, okay, what this implies, that there are, at the strong coupling limit, singularities that should emerge from Landau-like Landau -like diagrams inside of ADS. And what <coughs> they were able to show in this paper is that for dimensions up to three, these singularities can only come from diagrams such as that. So it, what I mean is, if you were to try to draw Landau diagrams in the boundary, which means in the perturbative regime in the CFT. So it's impossible to reproduce the singularities that appear in the bulk of ADS. That's what, why the, what they call the bulk point. And in some sense, this is a way to probe what they call bulk locality. So if you can see these kinds of singularities as, at the strong coupling regime, it's kind of a a trace of the fact that there is a gravity dual inside of ADS for a given CFT. And I think that's the main message of the paper. Okay. Questions? So I know very little about ADS CFT in general, so this might be a bit naive, but, but let me just see if I understand the, the general picture. So you had, uh, you're calculating the this, uh, D plus two correlators in, uh, in the, the, the strongly coupled CFT down there, yeah. right? So it should be something like, we have operator insertions in the cylinder. We want to compute this correlation function in the strong coupling regi regime. You can do that by computing these okay. written diagrams in ADS. Mm -hmm. But they're they're by you're they're null separated up there, right? Do you mean these points? Yeah, they're yeah. separated in the in which they're null separated where? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is just an embedding of ADS in a larger dimensional space. Okay, mm -hmm. so ADS lives in d plus one dimensions. You can embed it in a space between which with one dimension bigger. It turns out that the boundary of the ADS can be 
parameterized by those points. Okay, I see. In those sense, I mean, you can think of, so the boundary of ADS should have D dimensions, right? Mm. D, D independent coordinates. Mm. And here we have I goes from one to D plus two. Mm. So this is a, and we have, okay, we have one constraint, which should mean that there are D plus one independent coordinates, but due to the fact that we have this identification, we have in total I see. D okay. degrees of freedom. So this describes the boundary. I think it's my fault, but oh, can you explain the physical meaning of this equation you wrote? What? This, this one? The main result, right? This yeah, yeah, I, I guess so, yeah. So, okay. This means that we have, in, in this Witten diagram right here, we have a, a singularity whenever the points in the boundary are such that we can write a point in the bulk which are connected by no geodesics, new, no, no geodesics from all those points in the boundary, and such that we have a local momentum conservation here near the, near the interaction point. Okay. The momentum is not conserved overall because we are, the particles are moving in curved space, so there's like red shifts. But in a small patch here, which you can think of almost near flat, we have momentum conservation at the interaction points. But the main result is the momentum conservation? Or? No, it's the fact that whenever we have a point inside the bulk that can be connected by no geodesics, such that there is momentum conservation at the vertex point, we have these singularities in the Witten diagrams. Ah, okay. And they actually <coughs> generalize this. They actually argue that this not only holds for the contact interactions, but at this regime in which the determinant is zero, most amplitudes in ADS will be dominated by something which happens in a small patch really near here, so you can effectively, effectively change this I lambda for an arbitrary amplitude, and then this would give a singularity anyway. Mm -hmm. but, so. but, I mean, th this is more concrete. And, uh, Maybe it's not very related, but what's, uh, what's the advantage of it, of writing singularity in position space? I, I was hoping that you answered this question, that I, you, answer, you gave motivation of okay. writing singularities in moment. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, my, my intuition here is that, I mean, what I mean, mm, when you're studying like CFTs in D dimensions, uh, it's always easier to look at, at position space. I mean, momentum space, I, I guess, like, uh, the correlators in a CFT in position space have a very simple form, and the two points and three points have power laws and all that, and I think the Fourier transform forms are not that simple, but I'm not sure about that. But it's just easier to use position space when studying CFTs, so I think that's the point. But do you translate this singularity into the gravitational language, like in the... It's not that, not, I, not that I translate. I, I'm claiming that there is a singularity that you can only understand by looking at bulk physics. Ah, okay. Very nice. Thanks. So, at the very end, you mentioned the comments about dimensions. You said yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for instance, I, I'll do an example in two dimensions, okay? No? No, okay. No, okay. How? Okay, I can. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, so you, if you're looking to these bulk points that can't be reproduced by perturbation theory on the boundary, you have to look for sets of points such that this can happen in the bulk, but it, it is impossible to write no, no geodesics connecting these points such that uh, they encounter at some point with momentum conservation at the boundary. And what they did, they, they've shown that such configurations exist for D equals two and three, but it turns out, I mean, 
a cylinder is essentially S D times R. So for true dimensions and three dimensions, you have two dimensions just a line times R, and for three dimensions, a sphere times R. And you can easily find configuration of points such that there are points for which this happens, but they can't happen in the boundary. And they just say that they, are tr they tried to find it in four dimensions and they weren't able to. Because I, things get more, co you, have, you go to an S3, there's more points. And uh, the way I see it, it's just that they were, in, they were able to find, ex they were actually able to find, sorry, examples such that there are bulk points and you can reproduce them as these geodesics on the boundary. Yeah, that's there. The claim for d equals four, um, but they. In other words, the condition that is point P is not separated from the boundary in four dimensions doesn't define a point, but it defines a surface, and that surface goes all the way to the boundary, right? right. And therefore, it's there also in the boundary. So the singularity is there in the boundary too, and in the bulk field. Yeah. And so all theories, whether or not they are possible. Uh-huh. Okay. Right. I mean, I guess it should be possible to find a set of points such that mm, uh, I don't have the intuition right now, but they claim that uh, there should be some generic configurations in which you can find singularity in the bulk that they are not in the boundary, but I don't have the intuition to argue for that now. This would feel like a big yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so you put more points. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I see. Ah, okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but aren't I mean, six point five? We're considering d plus two points in d dimension, so this would be just plus yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, no, I agree. So yeah, that's consistent with your comments here. Okay. Very good. Okay, uh, I wanted to ask. In this case, we have considered the first order interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, when we consider the second one, I suppose that we will get to two vertexes on the, on the diagram. Do we have to change anything on our uh, on the, the procedure that you have made to, to obtain the same relations? Do we have something additional? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so that's related to a comment I've made in the talk that for more general interactions, When in points, when you're, we have this condition here for more general cases, there, and we are considering the, the integral near the point P, you can think of this as, so if you had, for instance, more loops, you could just, in the, the limit in which this happens, and we have this point P, the singularity will be dominated by something like the flat space limit of this amplitude with loops, which is localized in a small patch in ADS, which is near flat. So essentially, we, we, we will have to analyze this, the flat space limit of what's inside the amplitude to see if there are singularities or not. This is, is interesting. So that's why they, in their paper they argue that if you consider stringy corrections, there sh they, these singularities should go away, as we know that they have a soft behavior. 
high energies, but these are common. So yeah, but you should just switch this contact interaction by a flat space amplitude localized at this small patch if you're considering more general amplitudes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Valeu.